Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Charlene Baldwin. I'm the Dean of the Leatherby Libraries. And I'm an English major, yes, and so happy to see this resurgence of exciting um, attendance at events that celebrate English literature uh, and poetry. We've had standing room only events in this space for poetry as well. And, and Jane Austen is a person near and dear to my heart and I'm so happy that we're able to kick off this bicentennial celebration of sorts with this panel today, Austinalia. So I thought I would just say a few words first of welcome to our panelists who, uh, for whom this is the first time in the Leatherby Libraries and at Chapman University. I want to welcome all of you here, faculty, students, members of the community, alumni, and our esteemed panelists. You're gathered in the Doyen D. Henley Reading Room. When we designed this building uh, years ago, now it opened in 2004, <coughs> we, wanted, we knew we wanted it to be a gathering place and a, and a marketplace and a crossroads of information. Those were the words we used when we were designing this building. Who knew that we could have had a gathering place that even it should be even bigger than this space to have these kinds of events. And I just feel really proud of all the people that worked so hard to make this library a reality that we have this space, the Doy and D. Henley Reading Room, to host this event. This is also the space where we honor our emeriti faculty and administration and the current faculty awards are also in this room. We also have a gallery wall on this, in this room and down the other side, and currently you will be able to look at an exhibit that comes down this Friday called Brush with Nature, which is the Botanical Artist Guild of Southern California's work on doing exact scientific depictions of plants, and they're just beautiful works of art in their own right. That's what you see on our walls. We are celebrating Chapman University's 150th anniversary. I think you all have knew that by now. Um, we're very proud of our long heritage here, the sixth oldest university in the state of California, founded on March 4, 1861, as Hesperian College up in Northern California. So throughout this year, we have a, a dynamic series of events. So we're counting this one as another one of those 150th anniversary events, and we're so happy that you are all here to share that with us. Um, we are taping today, as you can see, the media, of, this is Panther Productions, right, folks? Yeah, Panther Productions are taping this, and Linda tells me that it'll be on the wiki blog at Wilkinson's homepage fairly soon. So whenever it gets ready, it'll be out there for us all to see again. Um, sh uh, Linda Hall is going to tell you about some of the other upcoming events associated with um, the celebration of Jane Austen, but I want to make sure you all at the end of this program when you're out in the lobby getting books signed and all to stop and take a look at the display case out there on the second floor. It was curated by um, our head of special collections and archives, Claudia Horn, also an English major and MFA from Chapman University here, and in it are works we have of Jane Austen's, including, maybe, I don't know if she'll open it up and bring it out to see, especially at the end of this, we were able to acquire this year the, a, a copy of the first American edition of Sense and Sensibility, which we are celebrating today the 200th anniversary of its publication. Someone was clapping. That is so cool, isn't it, that it's here. And um, so Claudia, under careful oversight, will probably get it out so you can see it in person. We're very happy to have that as part of our library forever now. So uh, be sure and take a look at that exhibit. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce your moderator and our friend and faculty member here from Chapman University. Linda Hall has been teaching here in the English department since 1986. She completed her bachelor's and master's degrees at Chapman, yes, and her PhD at Claremont Graduate University, specializing in 19th century British literature. Um, too bad we don't have a PhD program. Someday we will, and uh, I'm sure there will be specialties in 19th century 
British literature and 18th century studies too probably. Her dissertation focused on six of Jane Austen's minor characters, grounding the figure of the heroine, the other woman in Jane Austen's novels. She's taught a variety of English composition and literature courses, often including Jane Austen novels in the curriculum. How many in here are currently or ha who have had Linda Hall as a professor for your class? Good. You all signed in, right? Some of you, you have to sign in, so don't forget to do that too. Um, she's also taught three courses devoted exclusively to Jane Austen, both at the graduate and undergraduate level, and three courses for focusing on Austen adaptation into film. Professor Hall also teaches a freshman foundations course each fall about banned books. And we try to work with Linda and the whole banned books thing every year to remind people of how easy it is to lose sight of the freedom of the right to read. In 1997, she received a university award for teaching excellence and served as the director of writing programs at Chapman for four years. In addition to many Jane Austen presentations at the local and regional level, Dr. Hall has spoken at four Jane Austen Society of North America's annual general meetings in Richmond, Toronto, Tucson, and Vancouver. How many of you were at some of those conferences? Here we go. <laughs> Look at there. Okay. Did you sign in? <laughs> no. And has published three of her papers in Jasna's journal Persuasions. She is currently working on a book about Jane Austen and value. And I love the working title. I don't know whether it's still the working title. Sense, Pride, and the Market Economy, Tracing Values with Jane Austen's Writings. Making Jane Austen current today. This is so cool. So we are just so honored and pleased to have you all here today and to hear this amazing panel speak about Jane Austen. So let me introduce. Professor Linda Hall. A couple of reminders. Um, I put some note cards on each of the tables, and if you have questions that you know ahead of time you'd like to ask the panelists, I have a few questions we'll start with. But um, I can collect, we can get those collected at least, and that way we can keep everything on mic since we are being filmed, that we can. Um, all here, and then your friends and family, if they ever watch this later, can hear also. <laughs> um, also wanted to thank the library. Thank you, Charlene, and thank you, Claudia, so much for helping me coordinate this, um, helping us to find use this nice venue, and also to set up the display. It's fabulous, if you haven't seen it, with the hankies and the spectacles and all the, all the lovely things that would go along with, with reading and, and writing in Jane Austen's time. Along with the books of our authors that are here today, and those are, are also um, available here for checking out at the library. If you, if you can't quite purchase one today, you can still read their books um, if you're a student here. Um, also want to thank Wilkinson College of Humanities and Social Sciences and the Department of English for sponsoring this event and paying for this event. So we have to give them a, a, a big thank you. And then also um, the Jane Austen Society of North America, which we all call JASNA. And, no, but you wouldn't know, and I think that was good. And, and those, those annual general meetings are AGMs. So if we refer to JASNA or an AGM, that's what that's, that's about. This is a gathering of um, upwards of 600 people for a long weekend in an interesting place somewhere in a beautiful hotel, usually in a nice city. Next year it will be, or this, in, later this year it will be in Fort Worth, Texas. So it happens every year. It's definitely worth going to. You learn more about... You can learn the academic things or things about food and drink or dancing or clothing and all sorts of different things about Jane Austen and her time. Um, and also ja Jasna Southwest, which is the local chapter that helped me publicize this. And thank you to Lori because she's the webmaster for Jasna Southwest. So she's able to get things right up there right away for us. And it was very nice. I also wanted to welcome, I think most of you are in the back, we have students from OSHA today, a part of a creative, the creative writing program who are taking a Jane Austen class this semester. So that worked out nicely for us here. And um, thank you to Jim Blaylock for helping me coordinate that part of it and helping me transport Karen today because Karen came down from, um, from Northern California to join us. There's also a book sale, and you probably saw as you were walking by, and we'll have, we have the reception here with some food and drinks afterwards, and we'll have a short book signing um, 
you know, as long as we can, we can handle it. Um, so if you do purchase a book or you have your own book for any of these authors, Jane Austen will not be here today. Uh, she's going to be here next week. I'll tell you about that in a minute. I don't know that she'll be signing books. She hasn't practiced well enough. Her handwriting is a little rusty. But um, we do have an event that Wilkinson College is sponsors uh, three times a year. We have a visiting dignitary that has something to do with the humanities and social sciences and happens to fit in with the scholarly pursuits of some of our faculty. And a Tuesday night next, um, at the 22nd, at 7 o'clock in the Wallace All Faiths Chapel, Jane Austen will be gracing us with her presence. <laughs> and that will be me. <laughs> Jane will be talking to us about um, what it was like to be to publish at her in her day, and then also um, musing about what's happened with her, what she calls her darling children, which are her, her novels and her characters. What's happened to her darling children over the last 200 years? So it's, it's, it, it should be good, or at least interesting. <laughs> um, I also left information on Jasna and Jasna Southwest on, on the table out in the, the writing or the uh, sign, book signing table. For anyone who's interested, in May, they're having a large um, super regional event. So various regional, um, various regions have come together for this event to once again celebrate the publication of Jane Austen's first novel, or first published novel, Sense and Sensibility. And it's a two day event that will be held at the, at the Huntington Library. And that's, uh, all the information is available there and you can sign up, you know, sign up to go, pay your fee, the food and the drinks and everything is always, it's always very fun, very good. So, um, Austinalia, where does that come from? Where does that word come from? I think I made it up, but I don't know. Have you ever seen it before? Juvenalia. Juvenalia. See, that's where I got it from. So we called, we called Jane Austen's early works, the works that she wrote before she published anything, the works she wrote as a child and as a young adult, um, the Juvenalia. And so I thought, well, what, what, what do you call this Austin-related author thing? And I was having a chat with, with uh, Virginia Halverson, who's helped me from the dean's office to, to coordinate this. I said, let's just, I think I've seen this before, but I may have made it up. So I'm not going to take complete credit for it. So this is why I've called it Austinalia. Um, if you think about it, even though the juvenilia were written when she was very young, she was working on what we now know as Sense and Sensibility and what we now know as Pride and Prejudice as early as 18 or 19 years old. Um, they weren't published until she was in her 30s, but they were complete and um, in a different form. Pride and Prejudice was in, in a letter form at that point. So she was a very young writer, and she did die at the age of 41. So she published all six, well, she published four of the six novels before she passed away, and then her brothers published the last two the, the year after she died. So why these authors? Well, they're authors that, who have published works that are inspired by Jane Austen. They are members of JASNA. I've met them all before. They live close by. They were willing to come, and their books are very good, and that's part of the reason. You know, their books are very good. There are other good books that are part of the Austinalia group, and there are some that I would say don't bother. <laughs> but I would recommend all of them. I've read them all, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, each of these these panel members, and then we'll talk. To, we'll let, let them talk to you. Um, probably hundreds, would you say, Diana? Hundreds of Austinalia out there? Yeah, definitely. Hundreds, and more being written every day. I mean, you probably heard of Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters, <laughs> or Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Um, there, there is a whole, there's a whole group of that type. That's, that's the latest trend. So let me start talking about Diana. Diana, to my immediate left, to your right. Diana is a story analyst at Warner Brothers, and there, there are... Um, copies of these biographies that are dotted around the room and more out front. So I'm not going to, to tell you everything that's on these, but you have them available to you. Um, but she's a story analyst at Warner Brothers, and she says, I think she has the best job in the world. She reads books and stories to find out if they'd make good movies. What do you think? Is that a great job? <laughs> I like it. <laughs> she um, is the author of the Jane Austen-related novels, Mrs. Darcy's Dilemma, which we have out front, Mrs. Elton in America, and In Defense of Mrs. Elton. And if you've read um, Emma, you know Mrs. Elton needs a lot of defending. 
Her short story, Jane Austen's Cat, will be published in the forthcoming Random House book um, that is coming out in October. Jane Austen made me do it. And we also have in our audience today the, uh, the editor of that, of that book. And her name is Laurel Ann Nassaris. <laughs> she is, oh, she's standing here in the um, She also runs, she writes a blog, austinprose.com. And as the editor of the anthology right now, she is asked, she had a contest for people to submit additional short stories. And did you say you had close to 90 that were submitted by the deadline? And there is right now the opportunity for any of you who want to go on to her austinblog.com and read these stories and vote for your favorites to see what will end up in the anthology. And there may be a following anthology if they're good enough. Austinprose.com, right? not austinblog. Austin right, austinprose, all one word, .com. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here on Diana? Um, let's see, I also think it's, she's written a scholarly biography of her, her grandmother, the first Asian American novelist, called on Onoto Watana. Onoto Watana. It's a made up name, means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she's lectured widely on, on her books at universities, um, including Oxford, Yale, Columbia, NYU, and um, the Simone de Beauvoir Institute for Women's Studies. Uh, if you liked Pride and Prejudice and didn't want to see it in, I would recommend reading Mrs. Darcy's Dilemma. Imagine yourself 20 years in the future with the Darcy family and the visiting Wickham daughters. <laughs> if you can imagine what that would be. I won't tell you any more than that, but it should entice you. Uh, next to Diana is Siri James. Now, Siri has, um, is the best-selling author of four novels. Uh, first, her first novel was The Lost Memoirs of Jane Austen, which is what we'll talk about mostly today. Um, the Secret Diaries of Charlotte Bronte. She can dig up some diaries. And Dracula, My Love, which I, I haven't read yet. Notice the word yet, but it is taken from the point of view of Mina Harker. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, her her most recent novel, which is a contemporary novel, just came out in January. It's called Nocturne, Nocturne, which she describes as a haunting story of forbidden love. So Nocturne. Jane Austen is mentioned. Oh, she has. To. <laughs> Siri is also a screenwriter, and has. Um, after her successful career in Hollywood, in which she sold 19 screenplays and teleplays and plays in a variety of genres, so there's another way to go with your creative writing, those of you who are aspiring. Siri followed her passion and wrote a novel. And the first novel was the, well, or is it a novel or is it really true? The Lost Memoirs of <laughs> Jane Austen. And her short story, short, short story, Jane Austen's Nightmare, will also appear in uh, the, the collection. Jane Austen made me do it. Her next novel, Forbidden, is due out from Harper Teen in 2012. Now, Siri James' book, The Lost Memoirs of Jane Austen, you can probably figure out where that goes. Um, it imagines a scholar finding a lost diary, <coughs> excuse me, which details a short love affair between Jane Austen and a landed and titled gentleman. Or is it an imaginary one? It could have been true. Uh, next to Siri, we have Lori Vera Regler. She's the best-selling author of the novels Confessions of a Jane Austen Addict and Rude Awakenings of a Jane Austen Addict. Uh, Confessions of a Jane Austen Addict was, has also been published in Dutch and Italian, and Rude Awakenings will soon be published in Italy in 2012. In addition to working on her third novel, she's also the creator of a blog webcast. I don't know, what, what, you, how would you it's a it? web series. I a guess. web series of short pieces called Sex and the Jane Austen Girl, very fun, you should check it out, based on uh, Rude Awakenings and, and uh, Confessions of a Jane Austen Addict. Her story, Intolerable Stupidity, will appear in the anthology of short stories, Jane Austen made me do it. And um, prior to coming into her own as a novelist, she spent an exciting decade as a freelance book editor working with authors of fiction and nonfiction. She, her two Austin novels imagine two women trading places. Um, one from contemporary Los Angeles and one from early 19th century England. And they wake up unexpectedly in each other's bodies. And they have to adjust to all of the realities of those different times. And of course, they're both 
Jane Austen fanatics. Fanatics, I guess they couldn't say that about, about the girl from the 19th century. That's not the proper word, but. <laughs> enthusiasts. So right, enthusiasts, there you go, readers. Avid readers and then watchers of the videos. Now, <coughs> excuse me. The um, Sex and the Jane Austen Girl, am I saying that correctly? Sex, Sex and the Austen, Austen Girl, girl yeah. are a series of short um, videos where these two characters are speaking to each other and chatting about things like men, clothing, underwear, helicopters, <laughs> air conditioning. It's very fun, Mr. Darcy. You know, so it depends on that. So each, it, 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 they're very fun to watch, and they're three or four minutes long, and so they're they're definitely something you can get addicted to very quickly. I have. And then finally, on my far end, is Karen Joy Fowler. Now, this is Karen's second visit to Chapman. You came a few years ago, right um, after your, your book, Jane Austen Book Club, was published. Um, author of five novels and three short story collection. Her first novel, Sarah Canary, won the Commonwealth Medal for the best first novel by a Californian. That's a nice thing. Her third novel, Sister Noon, was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award. And then the Jane Austen Book Lo Club was a New York Times bestseller. That's the pinnacle. Movie. Then was also adapted into a popular film, um, written and directed by Robin Swicord, and starring Kathy Baker, Hugh Dancy, Maria Bello, Emily Blunt, and, em and Amy Brenneman. And if you haven't seen it, you read the book, do both because there's some differences, there's some interesting things, but they're both very enjoyable. Very now, you can read them, you can read it, any of these books, without having read any of Jane Austen's works. But I think that it enriches your reading of the Jane Austen works when you read these books and vice versa. I think you can, you can go back and forth with any of these. Um, Karen has two nebulas for short fiction, one being for the title story in a new collection, What I Didn't See. Another story, The Pelican Bar, recently won the Shirley Jackson and the World Fantasy Award. Um, Karen's, Karen's Austen-inspired novel imagines a bi-monthly book club focusing strictly on Jane Austen's books. Now there are six novels that were published and so every other month they read a different novel. Each of the, each of the hosts of the book club though finds his or her life strangely paralleling some of the characters in the book that they're hosting that, that, mo that month. So it's, it's, it's very imaginative, very wonderful. So that is our panel and I would like now to start asking some questions and hear what they have to say, and then I will take kind of a side a sideline here. The first obvious question to ask is about your connections to Jane Austen. Um, when did you first read Jane Austen? How were you first inspired to write a novel based on her novels? Why? So we'll start with anybody who wants to start, or I can just start to my left and start with Diana and move on. <laughs> well, I've been thinking of a quotation. And when Henry Crawford in Mansfield Park falls in love with Fanny, he says he, he didn't know when the pleasing plague stole upon him. And I don't know when the pleasing plague stole upon me, because I've been reading Jane Austen for about 40 years, and I haven't got tired of her yet. Uh, you know, I'm ashamed to say that I haven't read her hundreds of times. I've read her thousands of times. <laughs> so now you must think I'm a nut. But it has been very rewarding. Um, she, I call her my writing teacher, because if you read her that much, you learn so much, you find something new every time, which you can't say about most other writers. You see a turn of phrase, you, you get a new joke. But she's, and she's very funny, of course, but she's more than funny. She's, she's also, a lot of people find her a kind of solace, you know. And I think she's actually <coughs> just taught me a philosophy because I've, her, her balance of being rational and funny is really singular and something that I, it, I, I would always like to emulate. And of course you can't, you know, because she's the hardest person to catch in the act of genius. But even just trying um, makes you better. So anyway, long answer. Um, I agree with everything you say about <laughs> Jane Austen's genius. My uh, coming to love Jane was a little bit different story than that. Uh, I first read Jane in college in my British literature class, and I majored in English, and I loved her books. But she didn't really focus on, on come onto my radar again in a huge way until 1995 and 1996, which were banner years for film, Jane Austen. First there was Pride and Prejudice, the A&E version with Colin Firth. There was Sense and Sensibility, Emma Thompson. 
There was Emma with Gwyneth Paltrow and a wonderful version of Persuasion with Kirian Hines. And I saw all of these and I was just absolutely in love with all things Jane Austen. I've been writing screenplays for a long time and getting very tired of writing stories for other people and writing the screenplays that they wanted. And I just told my agent, I'm going to take some time and just write something that I want to write. I want to be in a Jane Austen movie. And I had, <laughs> then Shakespeare in Love came out and I said, what about Jane Austen in Love? Why hasn't anyone ever done that? So I reread all of her novels. Then I read a ton of Jane Austen biographies. And I was looking for when was Jane Austen in love? And there's only one real reference to her being in love, and it's a couple of sentences where her sister Cassandra, long after Jane died, admitted to her niece that if Jane ever did love anybody, it was a man she met at the seaside years ago. And she said to her niece, that the man died and they never heard from him again. And I thought, what if that wasn't true? What if he didn't die? And there was a reason why they had to cover up this huge romance. So I then read all of her letters, which you can find, um, they're so illuminating about her life. And I noticed a two-year gap where there are no letters at all. And it's well known that her sister Cassandra burned many, many of Jane's letters to prevent certain information and ways that Jane spoke about people from getting into her family's hands and the public's hands. So I thought, what if there's another reason why she burned all the letters for those two years? What if there was a wonderful romance that they both conspired to cover up? So that's the story that I decided to write, the, the romance that inspired Jane to go back to writing. She had a 10-year hiatus where she didn't write at all. What if she fell madly in love with someone, couldn't marry him in the end, but there's a really good reason why. <laughs> and now her d diaries have been discovered where she tells the true story. So that's my story. So it may be true. It could be. <laughs> it may be. And I, I interwove all the facts of her life with this imaginary uh, man. I really tried hard to create the man I believe Jane would have fallen in love with. And um, it was exciting because there were a lot of reviewers who thought it was truly Jane's diary and they didn't realize that someone else had written it until they got to the end and read the author's note. So um, maybe it did happen. <laughs> Laurie. Um, I've been reading Austen for about, I'd say, 16, 17 years. And I have been rereading Austen. I read each one of the six novels at least once a year. And I just, I thought I was alone in doing this. I didn't know that there were other people who also reread <laughs> Jane Austen all the time. I didn't know there was a Jane Austen Society until I started writing my first novel, which is Confessions of a Jane Austen Addict. And in doing my research, I realized there were all these other strange people out there who were addicted to Austen. And I just, I never connected to another author the way I connect to her. And for me, it's just this amazing knowledge, this, this, this amazing observing eye that looks at human nature and celebrates its glories and laughs at its failings. And it's tragic, they're tragic and they're funny. And I learn something about myself every time I read one of these books. So it's, it's new to me every time I recognize people I know. I recognize the good parts of myself, the bad parts of myself, when I'm being really honest. So I just see these books as completely entertaining self-help novels. <laughs> and how I started writing, how I got inspired to write um, these two novels was quite a surprise to me. I wasn't planning on writing a novel. I'd started a couple of novels before and, and lost interest, and I always wanted to write a novel, but I just didn't think I had the staying power. And one day I was doing something mundane in my kitchen, and all of a sudden I had the, the vision of Courtney Stone, the heroine of, of Confessions of a Jane Austen Addict, awakening in this bed in somebody else's body in Regency England. And I just, I saw it in my head, and I just kept thinking about her, and I thought, okay, I'm going to start writing this down. And before I knew it, I just kept writing and writing and writing, and several years later, in <laughs> a lot of research, I had my first novel. 
So, uh, yeah, I mean, why this particular character popped into my head is probably wouldn't take a rocket scientist to figure out since I was always rereading the novels and fantasizing about what would it be like to live in those times. So, yeah, anyway, that's... Do you, would you say that, that Courtney Stone is somewhat autobiographical then in some ways? Um, I mean, living in L.A. and working in the film industry. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of, there's actually a lot of me in both of the characters. Mm -hmm. Jane being the, the character from 1813 that takes over Courtney's life in the second book. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of me in them, and, and so yes and no. Okay, good. Uh, Karen? I um, share with everybody else on the panel um, many experiences with Austin's books. Uh, like everybody else, I think, on the panel, I do read them and reread them and reread them uh, I, and have done so since I was about 15. So I read them first when I was in high school. Pride and Prejudice was assigned to me in an English <coughs> class and that was my first experience with Jane Austen. Um, I think that I did not really, I, I, I loved the books but I, I just loved books. Um, I didn't really understand initially that I loved her more until I went to a party in college and I was introduced to a callow young man um, <laughs> who wanted to be a writer and um, because I was a great reader we were introduced under the assumption that we would like each other. Um, and he said um, that uh, something along the lines of, you know, that that there were limits to what women could accomplish when they wrote books. Um, that, and, and that, you know, that ha this had nothing to do with biology and had everything to do with life experience, that women simply didn't go to war. They didn't um, do drugs and uh, <laughs> hang out with prostitutes and have the adventures that made for great literature. Um, <laughs> And he kind of made an exception for Austin. He said she was, uh, that she knew, she knew what she could do, um, that she was, he said, a great little writer. Ouch. And I came home and uh, told my roommates about this conversation. I was, you know, absolutely steaming. And they all said, well, yes, you know, that was very insulting to women, that whole conversation. Obviously, you were upset. And I thought, no, it actually, it was, a, it was insulting to Austin. That's why I was upset. <laughs> um, and that's when I knew that we had a special bond, uh, her and me. I think that, you know, that there is something that, I mean, in many ways, I wrote the whole Jane Austen book club puzzling over why she does have such a hold on me. It's not something I can easily articulate. Even having written a book about it, even having been asked this question now many, many times, um, it's not something I can easily articulate. Uh, there's something very intimate about her voice when you read the book. Simultaneously, you learn nothing about her. It's a, it's a kind of, you know, she draws you in to this personal relationship you feel you have with her, but you put the book down and you think, well, does she approve of this or disapprove of that? You don't have a clue. You know, she hasn't given you enough information. And she is so frequently ironic that when you think you do have information, you think, well, but perhaps she didn't actually mean it when she <laughs> said it. Um, so you're completely at sea. Um, but I do think, you know, the books wear well. Um, they, they hold up very well under rereadings, and others do not. Well, the book that I wrote right after the Jane Austen Book Club um, was inspired to some much lesser extent by Agatha Christie, who was a writer that I loved as much as I loved Austen when I was 14 and 15. And I read, in order to write the book, um, I went back and I read several Agatha Christie books. I am sad to say that they are just preposterous. <laughs> and, um, I should never have reread them. I, I, the only advantage in rereading them, I feel, is that now I frequently know who did it because I actually read it 20 years ago and I remember just enough to think that I'm solving the, the case myself. <laughs> so there is that pleasure. But um, otherwise, I think.
think most of us writers probably do not need to be reread as often as Jane Austen does. So, so this is why she'll be here next week to talk about what's happened <laughs> in the last 200 years, right? I wish. Well, I, it would be nice to be able to really talk t talk to her and ask her these questions. I've just imagined answers to them and decided they're right. <laughs> no one to stop me. I'm just not at all sure she would approve of me, and that would be very hard to take. So I think but it's best that we have a distance of 200 years. <laughs> yeah, but I think she liked her, her bad people because she wrote them so well. I mean, think of the, like a, a character like, like Mary Crawford, where she really felt that, I think she felt that she wanted her to be the, the heroine of Mansfield Park, but realized she couldn't do that and have the happily ever after ending. And, well, and I would say that I am a lot more like Mary Crawford than too. I am like Fanny Price. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not sure that speaks badly for me, honestly. I, I don't think I could be Fanny Price. Um, <laughs> and if you haven't read Fanny Price, this will induce you to do that. Mansfield Park. Let's go on to the next question. Jane Austen struggled in her time in the late 18th and early 19th century to get her novels published. We'll talk about the world of publishing. And those of you out there who are aspiring writers who want to publish, you can think about this a little bit too. Um, she even had to pay for the publication of the first edition of Sense and Sensibility. She paid for the cost of publishing it herself. So she it was a vanity publication, we might say. <laughs> she did, but, but could you talk a little bit about your process of, of getting out there? I mean, you, like Sarah, you said you were a screenwriter, but you needed to do something different. How did, you, how did you start this whole publication process? How have you struggled? How have you overcome those struggles? You've all been published. Should we, we go in start, the same order? We can, or any order. I don't, I don't seem to. Okay, so. I'll, I'll go. Um, I actually was a screenwriter at the time that I came up with the idea to write about Jane, so I wrote it as a screenplay first. And I had a lot of producers very interested in it, but they couldn't get the financing at the time. This was 10 years ago. And so when I finally did decide to follow my real dream, I had always wanted to write books, I started by writing the wrong book. I wrote a medical thriller, not knowing that I was supposed to be writing historical fiction. <laughs> and I, I got a wonderful agent in Manhattan who loved the manuscript, but she couldn't sell it for a variety of reasons. So she came to me and said, um, what else would you like to write about next? So I sent her my Jane Austen screenplay. And she picked up the phone. She read it like in a day. And she picked up the phone and said, Siri, oh my god, if you can write this as a book, and you can write it in Jane Austen's point of view, like her memoirs, and sound like Jane Austen, I can sell this in five minutes. Now that was a huge, huge challenge. Because it's one thing to write about Jane. It's another thing to be Jane, to get into her mind and her heart and to sound like Jane, who's one of the most famous and beloved authors in the universe. So I had to really think hard about whether I had the nerve to do that. And what gave me the courage was I remembered when I was in college in an English literature class, I had just read Tom Jones by Henry Fielding, and I had this 18th century ling language in my head. And just for fun, I decided to write my the very first paper for that class as if I was Henry Fielding writing on whatever the assigned topic was. And I turned it in, and, you know, by Henry Fielding. <laughs> and I got an A plus and a message from the professor saying, you don't need this class. You, you're getting an A. Don't come back. <laughs> and I forgot about that for 30 years, and I wrote the wrong book, right? I wrote the medical thriller. So then it occurred to me, maybe if I could sound like Henry Fielding, I could sound like Jane Austen. So for one year, I just completely immersed myself in all Jane all the time. I read nothing but Jane over and over and over. And I read biographies over and over. And I watched the movies obsessively to see what they were wearing and what they were eating and what kind of horses they were riding. And so that's what I was doing while I was writing the book. And then um, it was a very exciting experience because I finished the book. I turned it in. My agent sent it out on a Wednesday. We got an offer on a Monday. And by Thursday, it was in a bidding war between three major publishing houses. And on Friday, it sold to HarperCollins. And um, it was a really wonderful experience to you know, go through the process of having the book published. So 
Does that answer that question? That's like that's well, right. well. <laughs> yeah. the opposite of Jane Austen's experience, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but really did good. Jane really pay for the publication, or was it someone else? If you read the Lost Memoirs of Jane Austen, <laughs> <laughs> you might find out. And uh, also, I should mention, in that book, it isn't really just about her love story. It's her evolution as a novelist. That is the other half of that tale. It's how she um, became the writer that she is, and her love of writing carried her through. And that's really the thing that drew me most to writing that story, was to see how she came to write Sense and Sensibility again and get it published. It was um, a lot of fun to do. Anybody want to go next? Oh, Diana? Yeah, kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum, because I kind of think Jane Austen was lucky to only have to wait 20 years to get published. <laughs> but um, now, I, it's all timing. And um, people had written sequels before. Her own niece wrote a sequel you know, in the 1850s, and you know, 150 years later, somebody else did. There seemed to be that one sequel every 50 years. But I think my Mrs. Darcy's Dilemma, which I wrote in 1994, was really the first of the Austin boom, but it was a little before the Austin boom. And uh, I had an agent who was excited about it. And then, just at the same time, two more came along. I was Presumption and Pemberley by more known authors. And they had, they had a Jane Austen war. And no publisher would take on a third Jane Austen sequel. because They thought that was, that was too many. <laughs> there, there wasn't an audience so that would buy three sequels. <laughs> so, so my agent said, I don't know what happened, but put it on the shelf. And it, this book is good. It'll be published in 10 years. So I did. And I went and I wrote that biography of my grandmother. And I did the first. Jane Austen internet serial and other stuff. And then a little English publisher came and published it in 2004. And then the boom started to <laughs> crest, and source books picked it up, deciding to make a whole stable of Austen sequels. And now there is, so it had finally got its national publication, and my Mrs. Elton book too. Um, but now I'm, I'm on a blog of, called Austen Authors which has 24 Austin sequelists. <laughs> it's, it, as source books and the other publishers are planning to turn it into a whole genre. Mm -hmm. And I feel, still feel a little out of place, as always, because they're all romance novels. And I don't do that. You know, I, I came to Jane Austen for the language. You know, I just meticulously analyzing her style, which is what drew me. Uh, not that you can imitate it in any way. But even just trying just makes you a better writer. And that was, that's my interest. And, um, and I think that when you read Diana's book, you really feel like you are reading a continuation of Pride and Prejudice. So, like it's 20 years in the future. It's 20 years, years in, in the, the future, future. And it's so unromantic that I actually have Mr. Darcy losing his hair. <laughs> <laughs> but they're still very much in love. Yes, they are. They, they're very it, much it's in happy. Love. Yeah. And they have, you know, they have, you can recognize, if you know the books well, you can recognize some characters from Jane Austen's novels that are kind of reflected in these characters, I think, in your novel. She's so but great not exact. There's just little inspirations here and there I think we can read. Uh, Laurie, Karen, either one? I um, had uh, 23 rejections on my first novel, Sarah Canary, before anybody took it, which was particularly harsh because I hadn't really wanted to write it in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> I had been writing short stories, and I had been doing that in a very deliberate and conscious attempt to learn to be a better writer. Um, almost everything that has happened to me in terms of my writing career has been unexpected. The, you know, the success has been unexpected. The rejection has been unexpected. It's all, it's all come as a great surprise to me. Um, so one of my first surprises um, was that even as a short story writer, I could not get published for several years. Uh, when I did publish, because I read everything, uh, because there is no part of the bookstore or library that I am not interested in, I wrote everything. And the first stories that I sold, sold to science fiction magazines. And, um, and then suddenly I was a science fiction writer. The uh, implications of that label I was completely ignorant of. Um, I did not understand that this meant I was not supposed to write anything that was not science fiction from now on. Uh, I, I did not know that that contract had been 
had been signed. And so when I was approached, actually, by an editor to write a novel, um, I really was this stupid. I did not understand that although she had read my science fiction stories and worked for a science fiction publisher, that I was supposed to write a science fiction novel. I honestly did not get that. And even so, the novel I wrote, I can argue, is a science fiction novel, even if nobody else quite sees it that way, which is <laughs> sort of the story of all my science fiction. Uh, a famous editor in the field um, describes a certain kind of science fiction as being, um, did, you see a, did you just see a dinosaur in the shadows? Um, and then the story goes on as if you did or did not. But um, th that's the kind of science fiction I write, that just, there's just one moment where there's a dinosaur in the shadows somewhere, and then, <laughs> and then we go back to our other story. So um, I was still trying to figure out how to write short stories. I did not really want to write a novel. Um, when I started the novel, I did get very caught up in it. I did fall in love with my characters. I began to see the advantage of being with the same people over the time it takes to write a novel. And then when nobody wanted it, I thought, well, I just really had been sold a bill of goods once again and would not make that mistake again, would not be writing another novel. So I'm afraid once again, you know, if I were Austin, we would not have those six novels to read. Um, but eventually uh, it was it was bought. It was bought in much the same form that it had been rejected in 23 times. It was published in much the same form. It had been rejected in 23 times. And it won the Commonwealth Award for the best novel by, uh, best first novel by a Californian. So it just makes no sense to me. <laughs> None of it makes any sense to me. And I have uh, long ago stopped trying to make sense of it. Just. Plan to be surprised by whatever happens next. Do you sometimes wonder what novels are out there that are fabulous that have never been? Well, published? I don't even have to wonder. You know, I teach a lot, and I see uh, fabulous novels. I can, off the top of my head, have read in the last five years alone. I would say seven novels that I just think are spectacular that nobody will buy. <coughs> even though I personally phone the editors and tell them. This is a spectacular novel. They do not agree when they read it somehow, or else they think, well, yes, it's a spectacular novel, but who's going to want to buy it? So it's another Moby What's, Dick. Who's the audience <laughs> for this book? Laurie? Yeah, I, I so agree with what Karen just said, that there are so many great unpublished novels out there. From having worked as a, a freelance book editor for years, I worked with some extremely talented authors and um, who just haven't been published. So it's, I mean, when I was writing my book, my first novel, um, I read ev everything. I've heard all these naysayers pronouncements. You know, you're as likely to publish your first novel as you are winning the lottery. Mm -hmm. I mean, my advice to anyone out there who's writing a novel, just don't listen to them. Do not listen to them. Um, a friend of mine who died last year, um, Dr. Ron Gottesman, who was a professor at USC, one of the things he said to me when I was uh, trying to get my, my first novel published was, um, it takes the three Ps, patience, persistence, and postage, to which, <laughs> to which I would add paper and printer cartridges. You just, you have to be persistent. and. Um, what really helped me when I was, because I took, I took six years to write Confessions of a Jane Austen Addict. I am a master of procrastination, and I love to do research. And it, the books had to be very heavily researched. But research for me is also a really pleasant form of procrastination. <laughs> so, because I knew, I knew that once I finished, I'd actually have to start sending it into agents and get rejected, which I did many, many times. But I, f I just stuck with it. I'd send out as many queries as I could emotionally handle. At the same time, I had, oh, this was really, really helpful for anyone who's writing a novel. If you get stuck while you're writing or you, you know, lose confidence, what I did was I started working on my query letter, which is, uh, everyone know what a query letter is? OK, so this really helped me because it helped me to crystallize in my mind what my book was about, and basically the query letter is 
what it has in there is what people are going to read on the jacket copy of your book or the back cover of your paperback. So it really gets you to just put in a very short form what's the essence of this book, why you're so excited about it, why people might want to read it. And that would always help me to go forward and continue with the book. And actually, by the time I was done with the book and done procrastinating and rewriting it a zillion times, I had a really fantastic query letter. <laughs> so that helped me ultimately get a fantastic agent who got me you know, four offers after you know, many, many rejections from other agents. So you just never know, like Karen was saying. And prepare to be surprised. I totally agree with what Karen said. And just be really persistent and don't give up. Just have faith. Well, I think there's a famous, famous story of um, Jane Austen after her, her father had sold her. The first novel that was sold was called Susan, which we now know as Northanger Abbey, which was never really published in her, in her lifetime. But he sold it. The publisher then didn't ever publish it and would not give it back to her, would not sell it back to her. And, and she wanted it back. This was after her father passed away. And she wrote a, a letter. And of course, as a, as a young unmarried woman, or not even young anymore, unmarried woman, she wasn't able to really stand up for herself. She didn't have any legal standing. So she wrote this letter, signed Mrs. Ashton Dennis, and signed it with the initials M A. D to get her, she wanted her, her novel back. And of course, she wasn't able to get it back in, for another four or five years after that. But, but this is that same kind of persistence. And she worked on um, the revision of, of what we now know as Northanger Abbey as she was dying. She was ill, she was dying, but she continued to work on that revision of that first novel that she had sold. So, um, and it's the first one I ever read. It was my favorite for a long time. I've, I've changed, but. But I think that that's that, that persistence, we can see that inspiration from, from Jane Austen herself. I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask for some of, if some of you have questions that you've written on cards. Um, if, you, if you have a, a question written on a card, if you could pass those down to, the, to this end, and that way they would be easier for somebody, um, Virginia will pick them up and, and bring them up to me. That way I can kind of sort through and see what we, we can ask. Um, I read a recent article about the design of book covers for books with a perceived primarily female audience. Cassia Ka Croser writes about the bodice refer romance book, um, covers from the 70s and 80s. And she says that they were designed more for the male book buyers, the buyers for the bookstores, than they were for the female audience. Beyond the covers, however, she writes, male fiction is taken more seriously on many levels. And yes, the stupid covers play a negative role in this. Women's fiction suffers from the belief that domestic issues, home and family, are smaller and less important than big issues. There is, this is a perception that predates the Victorian notion of spheres, the interior sphere, the home sphere, the, out, the ex exterior sphere, with a feminine domestic sphere treated as less important than the mainly manly public sphere. What do you think about these things? Um, but both the book cover designs and the perception of the domestic as less important than the topics usually perceived as mainstream topics for fiction. I think, Karen, you already talked a little bit about that. Um, I don't know if you want to expand well, on that. Well, this is, yeah. you know, this is a, a topic on which I could talk for quite some time. <laughs> so the, the trick will be limiting myself and letting other people also, also talk. Um, you know, you want to talk about stupid covers, uh, <laughs> publish some science fiction. Uh, <laughs> see what happens to your book. When, it's in the bookstore. Um, I had a, a, with the Jane Austen Book Club, um, I, I had two kind of simultaneous experiences. The book was published in England at the same time, pretty much, or shortly after it was published in the US. So, so decisions about the cover and about the packaging and about the way the book would be promoted were going on in these two different places in, uh, at the same time. And clearly in England, although they would never, ever, ever admit this to me, it is very clear that they had decided to market it as a chiclet book. And the cover is um, pink, which, you know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> pink. is there really anything left to be said? Um, <laughs> kind of um, cartoonish figures in um, very girlish sorts of poses, um, 
and in the U.S., um, the cover is a, a very detailed painting of strawberries. And, um, and you know, but the, the U.S. publisher, again, was very deliberate about it and talked to me about it. The British publisher, I think, was also very deliberate about it but would not talk to me about it. That the U.S. Um, publisher was very concerned that it not be seen as a chiclet book, that it be seen as literature and, and that this would be tricky, you know, that the packaging and the way it was promoted had to be handled carefully for that to happen. Um, and so, uh, as I said, it was interesting to, to watch the two approaches and, um, and to read many of the reviews in England, um, all of which complained about the cover and said, you know, if, um, mm -hmm. if the book hadn't come to my attention in some other way, if I'd just been in the bookstore, I would never pick up a book with this cover. Um, on the other hand, it sold so well that it was hard to persuade the publishing house that they had made a mistake on the cover. So, um, you know, we, we the, the idea of, um, of women's books being lesser, as I said, you know, first came across my consciousness at a party when I was 19, mm -hmm. and um, I don't really think things have changed. I'm 61 now. I don't think things have changed a whole lot since then. Jonathan Franzen is frequently the That's kind the of yeah. emblematic name, you know. he. He writes about the family, he writes, uh, he has a domestic kind of focus, and yet those are great American novels. And there have been, in response to the um, exuberant reception his book got, you know, a whole new set of articles about whether a woman can write the great American novel, and, um, and if not, why not, and why women all now acknowledged to make up the vast majority of the reading population still um, the number of men published as opposed to women published is still something like three to one. Uh, and again, you know, in all of the time that I've been in publishing, those figures have not changed. I will stop, Anyone not else? because I wish to, but because it's only <laughs> polite. Uh, you can take my time, too, because nah. I don't have anything to say about book covers. I do. I think it's really interesting that in Jane Austen's day, um, when you sold your book, it could come out six weeks later, and it would either have a plain pasteboard cover or it would be bound in leather and embossed in gold, and that was it. There was absolutely no concern about what should be on the cover. And it's really a rather modern thing to have all this time and effort go into this visual look for the cover. And um, that's one of the many reasons why it takes a year for a book to come out after we turn in a manuscript. It's an entire year, usually, before you see it. Um, I've been very lucky. Um, they've had wonderful art departments that have made some beautiful covers for my books. And I'm really happy with all of them. Um, I did have to give some input on the book Dracula, My Love, which the cover first came back looking all white and girly. And I said, this is a vampire romance. It has to be black, and it has to have a castle in it. And so when they finally came back with the new cover, it was wonderful and really emblematic of, of what the passionate story is about. Um, but when you talk about domestic stories and are they as important, you know, Jane Austen wrote domestic books. They're about three or four families in a country village and a courtship and all the characters and their lives at home. And 200 years later, we're still reading them. So I'd like to see 200 years from now these books that aren't called domestic books. Are we still reading them? Do they matter as much? So I would argue that um, these kind of books uh, last longer because they speak to our hearts and they are character driven. And I really think that these are the kind of stories that stand the test of time. Um, I just like to add that um, I think that women yes, definitely, are marginalized in the literary world. There's no two ways about it, in my opinion. Um, but I think that until women, I think that until women take themselves as seriously as writers, as men do, this will continue to happen. I think that this is not only men marginalizing women, I think women are marginalizing themselves and one another. I think that um, 
we have to not be defensive and we have to say, you know, and this is not just in, 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 uh, in books. This is, I was having a discussion about this after I received, you know, an idea of what your questions were going to be, Linda, with a friend of mine at lunch and she said to me, well, until, um, you know, changing a diaper and giving birth to a baby and raising a child is considered to be as important as, you know, being a captain of industry, this is not going to change. And I think we just have to take ourselves more seriously. And um, I also think, you know, one of the criticisms of Jane Austen as an author is, well, she lived through the Napoleonic Wars, but she shouldn't write about war. And that would mean that every contemporary author right now should be writing about Iraq and Afghanistan. And of course, that isn't the case. But so, I mean, we just have to not buy into it, I think. If, if you're a woman and you're writing, you just have to take your own writing seriously. And I think if you take your own writing seriously, it doesn't matter what the cover is. I mean, yes, I always get completely nervous when the cover is coming out. And my British covers are more girly and chick litty than my American covers. But I've come to the point where I decide that if that book is going to, what I want to do with my writing is to spread happiness. And if that cover is going to make somebody happy, and I can give a little input on it and attract somebody and get them to read my book, and they're happy from reading this book, that's fine. You know, call it chick lit, call it romance, I don't care, because I used to be sensitive about all those labels, too. Um, anyway, that's, I could go on forever since this, yeah. too, so I'll shut up. Um, I'm going to kind of combine one of the questions I had with some with one of the questions from the audience, and we'll talk a little bit about movies here because we haven't really talked. And, and all of you, in some way or another, have had experience with with the film industry. We have we have um, quite a vibrant film school here at Chapman, and a lot of students interested in in film. And here we are in you know Southern California, the film capital of perhaps the world, right? Um, so each of you has had experience in one way or another in the film industry, either writing screenplays, reading novels to find good movie ideas, or having your works adapted into film. Um, can you talk a little bit about how these two forms of writing inform each other or how they might conflict? And, um, and then one of the, I've got three, three kind of s side questions, but um, well, we'll get to those after we, we chat about your experience with film. And I know... You know both you first. Siri and Diana have worked in the. Well, there, there are a lot of similarities between writing screenplays and writing novels. Um, they, they all start, first and foremost, as um, a story with hopefully great characters that we can sympathize with, a story that moves us. And they, uh, we learned in screenwriting about structure of a story. It should start with an inciting incident, something that gets the ball rolling. There should be plot points throughout the story that turn the story in new directions. And, um, and yet, despite the similarities between working on characters and working on plot, um, the differences are astounding, which, which I found when I left screenwriting to the side and took up novel writing, I was in absolute heaven. Because when you write a screenplay, it is basically like a little outline. You, um, you are limited to 120 pages maximum. No scene can be longer than two and a half pages. No piece of dialogue can be longer than three or four lines. And when it comes to the description, you get to say, interior, Chotton Cottage, day. <laughs> Jane is writing at her desk. She tosses down her pen in frustration. That's it. And now we need dialogue. And when you're writing a book, you get to get into their head and we hear their thoughts and feelings, and we can describe the room, and the curtains, and the aromas, and the garden, and the weather, and the clothing, and most importantly, again, thoughts and feelings. And that is what is so gratifying about writing a book. I felt like I'd been in a straitjacket for 15 years and finally got to throw it off. And so for me, um, it was a wondrous experience to, to write a novel after writing screenplays. They both have their uses, and they both are important forms of fiction. Um, and I think they do inform each other. You, you learn to write economically <coughs> when you write a script. And then you can really let yourself go and write a book. 
Diana, do you have anything to add to that? Or uh, you're no, a different, I've, a I've different never, yeah, angle. Yeah, from a different angle. Um, I've never written a screenplay. But um, I read books all day long to see if they should make movies. And what, what you look for is you have to divorce yourself and your own interests from it completely. Because uh, Warner Brothers mostly wants to make big tent poles. You know, and nearly all the books I, I read, come to think of it, are written by men. Um, I had not realized that until this moment, but it's true. And matter of fact, I think we categorically uh, don't even read romance novels. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I look to see, you know, I imagine it is a movie, and probably 99 out of 100 just are not what they're looking for. Um, I don't know. So, okay. so someone else asked, how did you get that job reading books for Warner Brothers? Oh, Brothers? Yeah, oh, that sounds amazing. Interesting story, yeah. Well, I moved out to California from New York with a, my little child when I was uh, you know, right out of college. And I couldn't you know, get a job very easily, just typing and whatever. And an aunt reminded me about my grandmother, you know, who'd been a novelist and had been story editor of uh, Universal Pictures in 1924. And her agent was still alive. And so my aunt said, he was an old guy, an old agent with a little red bow tie. And, and, and this, this is in the 70s. And my aunt said, why don't you give him a call, you know, and, and see maybe he can find something for you. And he said, oh, yeah, well, here, here's some scripts to read. <laughs> and that's, that's how, I, how I started. But I didn't realize that we were going to be four generations of one family working in story departments. Because my grandmother was the st was story editor. My father had done some of that kind of work for a while. And then me. Um, and then my son ended up working, um, you know, in the story department. So that's kind of unusual. Um, but you know, what's funny is when I was writing the biography of her, I went to Calgary where, they, where all her papers are. And all her screenplays are there back from the 1920s. And, and all her inter-office memos. It's like a time capsule. And here's her granddaughter, who's a professional story analyst, reading her, her professional script. And that woman worked hard. I mean, she did not sleep her way to the top. She, churning it out, <laughs> churning it out, you know. And what was bizarre to me is that it was everything, all the memos and all that could have been done today. Uh, story departments haven't changed. The process hasn't really changed. Um, anyway, it was so an all an adventure. Anything notable that's been made into a movie that you've read that? Oh, that yeah. I mean, I've been around forever. And I was the first reader on Terminator and Rocky. And, the right stuff, and, and um, all boy I, movies, aren't they? <laughs> pretty much, but pretty I just, much. I just divorce, you know, my own taste. People always say, "How can you read all these violent things?" You know, I just look to see if it's good within its genre. You know, which, whether I think other people would like it, because I certainly wouldn't. You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I like to read Jane Austen, and nobody was more surprised than me when when she started getting filmed. Right, there was a jump between 1940 and 1994. Really, that was pretty the, the much. Big, I think the there was Pemberley jump. Shades was uh, uh, and there written were the, in World War the II. Masterpiece Theater, tele television. That didn't happen until movies. there were that one the or 80s, two movies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it, I, I never would have foreseen right. this tremendous boom. And just when you think, surely it's peaked. You know, don't write another Jane Austen related book. People are going to be, you know, in in my 30 or so years in the movie business, we see cycles. You know, I, I read Godfather copycats for 10 years. I read Star Wars copycats for 10 years. They sort of overlap. I've read dwarves, you know, and from the Lord of the Rings cycle, I never want to see another dwarf. <laughs> and uh, we're at the moment where at the it's sort of late middle end of the Harry Potter thing, uh, lot, young adult fiction has really started burgeoning, and I, I put that to Harry Potter. Good writers are going into writing young adults. If, if you like to write young adult novels, they're no longer, you know, Judy gets to go to the prom. They're real stories now and well written. And I, you know, my heart leaps when I get a young adult novel to read instead of, you know, something with a star, you know, star or hardware or the mafia. Or, you know. <laughs> and it's, it's nice. Well, I've gonna, seen all these cycles, and the Jane Austen cycle is not burning out. No. It goes from, you, know, you think that's a big boom, now it's going to flop because they all do. And that becomes more. <laughs> I don't know where it's going to go. Well, the, I, like I don't know if you've, if you've noticed, but in the theaters right now is a new a Sense and Sensibility adaptation called From Prada to Nada. I saw it a few weeks ago, and definitely worth seeing, especially if you've, if you've read Sense and Sensibility. It's very funny, very, very funny, very good. About a, two girls who lose their, their father. Um, they live in Beverly Hills. Their father dies, and they have to move in with their aunt in East L.A. 
and they have to adjust to the difference between Beverly Hills and East LA. It's very, it's very cute. I think my favorite of all time was Clueless. Clueless is fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. How many of you grew up watching Clueless? See, look at this. As if. <laughs> As if. <laughs> um, Karen, or I mean, Karen, you're now you had you know a, a quite a famous, a well done movie I think made of your bestseller. Um, what? How was that process? What? Well, it was. Um, it was interesting, <laughs> you know. It was um, it was unsettling mm -hmm. it, it, to such an extent that uh, I I kind of chose to be uninvolved. Mm -hmm. it, it was. Um, well, that's what Alice Walker did with the color purple. You know, she kind of backed off. To I mean, it, so you know, but don't get me wrong. I was not invited to really participate, mm -hmm. but um, but you know, I could have been on the set. Um, I was more. on her set. I could have been. I saw her movie um, being made. <laughs> There, there was talk at some point that I could be in the background of a scene if I wished, my husband and I. Um, and, um, and I just, uh, and, and the first time I saw it too, I was, it was a, a very trippy experience. I cannot say it was entirely pleasant. Um, well, things were was, switched around quite a bit. Things from the were way switched you had around quite a bit. And, and yet I think by Hollywood standards, it was a pretty faithful adaptation. Mm -hmm. So. You know, it's just um, kind of the second time I saw it, when I was able to relax, um, <laughs> I saw that uh, uh, I focused less on the things that were not my book and more on whether it was an enjoyable movie, which I think it, it was a very enjoyable mm -hmm. movie. Um, but it, it took me a while to get to that. And I think, you know, um, I took a... a year or so of screenwriting at UCLA and I learned a lot about about the way um, you know not just about the writing process but sort of about the way Hollywood thinks about writers and about books and I, one of the issues that I have with the Austin editions uh, the Austin movie versions is that you know what I want and what Hollywood wants they're not the same thing <laughs> I love that book I want that book on the screen I don't want Think people deciding, you know, oh, the hero is not good looking enough and too old. Um, let's make him younger and sexier, and then, you know, Emma can fall in love with him more understandably. I don't want that. I want him exactly the way he is in the in the in the book that I read. And Hollywood wants to make a good movie. They don't care if it's faithful to the book or not. That's not what they're about. I want to see the book. And whenever I love a book, that's what I want to see, which is why, in general, it's best not to go to the movies based on books, <laughs> <laughs> on books that you love. If you, if you see the movie first, then you can go read the book, and the pleasures of the book are undiminished. But if you read the book first, then you just sit and seethe mm -hmm. through the movie. <laughs> <laughs> why these idiotic choices have been made as opposed to the... Uh, and it's not just Austin. Don't, I'm the uh, yeah, one funny person in the world who loathes the three Lord of the Rings movies. <laughs> <laughs> what? But, but it's funny how these things have evolved because I remember when there was talk in the Jane Austen Society about this new this new Pride and Prejudice written by Andrew Davies that was going to be a miniseries and, and there was going to be a sexy Mr. Darcy and he was going to be in the bathtub and he was going to get wet and be in the, the, the lake. And, and you know, those same people who were worried about that are in love with Colin Firth and want to marry him. So, <laughs> you know, it's funny how those things evolve and now yeah. many of you probably came to Pride and Prejudice through that miniseries. And that's your vision of what Mr. Darcy's like. But it was very, do you remember how controversial it was when it was coming out? You know, the, the sexy Darcy. Oh, no. Now we all think he must be very sexy. <laughs> um, now, Laurie, just specifically your, your, um, your web series, uh, you want to talk about how that came about? I mean, this is the, the future of, of perhaps filmmaking. Who knows? Well, um, I, I, there are people in my life that are, are working on developing um, my, both of my books into, for television. We are thinking about movies first, now we're thinking about television. And um, it was kind of a, a desire for immediate gratification. Well, why don't we just make a web series instead of you know, waiting 
to because development process is just so so long forever as as <laughs> probably everyone my fellow panelists can attest to um, it was uh, and it was also this fulfillment of a fantasy because in my, my two books, the, the two heroines don't meet. The uh, Confessions is about um, the 21st century heroine who ends up in Regency England, and Rude Awakenings is about the 1813 woman who ends up in the 21st century. But in my web series, I could actually have them talk to each other. It's kind of like a, like a reality show where they're being interviewed, but we don't see the interviewer, and they're talking about... Um, the differences, and this is, you know, a core theme of my books, the differences between then and now and how we've romanticized um, Regency England, mostly because of the movies, and, uh, or because of the, the fact that Jane Austen's books are so spare of, of detail, because she wrote for her contemporaries, and what's better about today and what's worse about today and vice versa, and these two women could sort of debate those ideas. So that was just, it was just a fun thing to do and, and uh, I, I've received a lot of positive feedback about it. Air conditioning, it's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Have you all seen the Jane Austen Fight Club on yes. the web? Funny. Yes, yes. Right. Very funny. There, and there, there are several little web versions of some of the monster mashups too, the, the Sense of Sensibility and Sea Monsters. And I think there's a um, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies in production, I've heard. So we'll see how that comes out. I'm going to ask one last question, and then we can get to the um, book signing, and we can chit-chat a little bit more. Um, if Jane Austen were present today, how do, you take, how do you think she would take the seemingly constant reinvention of her novels in other forms, other novels, plays, films? What do you think she would think about your books, these movies, the web series, et cetera? I mean, this is asking you to imagine, not that you can't do that. I think it's but completely unimaginable, and Lori's the one to, who does imagine those things. I think we oh. can wait until next week and ask her. Well, I'm just asking. Yeah. Her. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> Even better. I know what I think. I think she'd be absolutely thrilled and would try to remain anonymous because that's what she tried to do. But then after a while, I think she'd give up the anonymous thing. Wouldn't you? <laughs> I hope she'd be happy about well, she'd be, it. She would be happy to be getting a lot of pewter. <laughs> yes. I think she would like script. some of the adaptations a lot better than others. <laughs> True. True. Yeah. You don't think she'd like the Patricia Rosima with all the slave slavery? <laughs> I think not, and possibly not the Kira Knightley Pride and Prejudice either. <laughs> So one of, one, of our, one of our audience members kind of asked a question along those lines. If there are two adaptations of a particular novel, why do you like one better than another? So why would you, why, why do you say Falling that about the <laughs> Do we need to say more? <laughs> well, it can't be in all of them. <laughs> I do not see why not. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand. Well, Bridget Jones liked problem. him also, didn't she? Yes, she did. <laughs> right. So, um, so Kira Knightley, um, what are, I, mean, I, I hear that so often within, within the Jane Austen Society. Um, I, I, I liked some things about that, that, that movie. I, I didn't like other things about that movie, but um, I, I like the fact that it's two hours long and not six. Um, <laughs> I, I think I can show it in a class, and, and with the Pride and Prejudice miniseries, it's a miniseries. Every single time that, that Elizabeth has to run across the field, we run across the whole field. <laughs> <laughs> Which gives us a sense of reading a novel nice and leisurely and pleasant and all, but not, not necessarily for a movie. So are there specific things that you dislike about some of the, the adaptations that, that, that made you want to change or, or leave the, film, the, the movie theater? I, I could think of one thing. Mm -hmm. It was uh, the... Uh, the recent adaptation of Mansfield Park where Fanny Price was depicted as somebody who was walking around the daytime with, with a wonder bra and a very low cut <laughs> um, <laughs> bodice and it was just Fanny? Oh, Fanny yeah, that Price. Was Billy Piper, she, wasn't yeah, it? Oh. Right. Yeah, it was who would always be covering up, I'm sure. She was also blonde. Yeah, she's with the bad opposite. Roots, it was opposite right? cast. That didn't you know? even bother me. It was no, just I'm the good. it was I, I just that really that really bothered me. 
so it's that I'm very into the, the attention to detail. So mm -hmm. stuff like that really bugs me. The new two-hour version of Sense and Sensibility, which I thought was I wonderful, except seen. that they moved Barton Cottage to the seaside in a totally different, you know, county. And uh, so I didn't like that. Um, I'm used to it being where it's supposed to be. <laughs> but it was nice to see the story opened up. Um, I think the Kira Knightley version, as we call it, the two-hour version of Pride and Prejudice, its value is that it brought that story to some new audiences mm -hmm. who would only see it if it was two hours. But when my husband and I went and saw it, when it came out, it, we finished watching it. It was about um, 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and we looked at each other. We had seen the A&E version with Colin Firth probably 12 times at least at this point. <laughs> We looked at each other, and my wonderful husband said, let's go home and watch the good one. <laughs> <laughs> and we got takeout. We went home and watched the first hour of the good one. And then he goes, let's just watch another hour. And we just kept watching. So that was five hours plus the other two. So that's seven hours of Pride and Prejudice all in a row in one day. And we finally, you know, we got our fix. We got the story the way we wanted it. Well, if you had just bumped your head and fallen asleep and, and, and been in a, a bit of a coma, you'd have woken up as, as Courtney Stone. <laughs> if you follow the plot. Because I think, isn't she watching the video as, as she falls asleep or something? Like no, she's, she's reading Pride and Prejudice. Oh, she's reading and, she's, and she falls into a vodka induced stupor. <laughs> sleep. I thought she hit her head in the pool. Well, that's. Anything else that you've, I, I, is there anything else that you'd like to say to wrap this up, maybe just as a conclusion? Because I think we're, we're getting That's close to 5.30 and I wanted to kind of wrap it up about now. <laughs> she did hit her head in the pool. Yeah. She did bump her head in the bottom she's of the pool. She's correct. She's right. She did hit her head in the pool. She wrote but it. she thought that she went to sleep. But she also had too much vodka. Yes. Before she bumped her head at the bottom of the pool. So she went swimming afterwards. Right. You're absolutely right. She, need the good she knows one my book isn't better isn't the movies, it's the books. <laughs> Right, yeah. right. So the good version is your version in your head. In my head. Right. It never, my ma never matches up with, uh, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow or whoever. It's just a different animal. <laughs> and that, you know, one of the things that I think when you said Clueless was your favorite. Yeah, because um, it didn't try to it, And And be. we had um, at, at one of the, the Jane Austen Society annual general meetings, the AGMs, the one here in L.A., we had a panel of screenwriters, and one of those was... Um, Amy Heckerling. Amy Heckerling. Why can't I think of her name? And uh, she was a, a who? More than a hoot, she was hilarious. But she talked about that. She said, you know, I couldn't really translate the secret engagement of, I hope I'm not giving this away if you've not read Emma. Too bad, <laughs> your problem. Um, oh. The secret engagement of don't, don't spoiler. Don't of the two. I couldn't, because who cares about a secret engagement in the 20th century? Mm -hmm. Nobody cares anymore, so I just had to make him gay. And then it worked out <laughs> because then he was totally unavailable to her, and that's what made it work. And and so to think about how does it really translate to a modern audience, we have to make it modern to do it right. Well, she had a sense of humor, and Jane Austen had a sense of right. humor, and it worked. One of the best, I think, essays I've read about Clueless said something like, "This is the." best translation of Jane Austen's irony because we understand it. It doesn't have to be explained to us. We understand when Cher walks out and she says, I'm a totally normal teenager. And we see her picking out her clothes on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> There's the irony. How, what, how many of you do that? And this was what, 15 years ago. I've never done that and I never will. And then she pushed a button and the, the closet turns and everything, and then the outfit comes out. It's fabulous. And there's, a, there's the perfect kind of irony that Jane Austen used, and, and that's how it translates well. Hopefully, um, Amy Heckerling will do another screenplay someday, another Jane Austen novel. She knew it pretty well. Well, um, anything else? We done? I want to thank you all. This was fabulous. Really enjoyed hearing about you writing. <laughs>